If we want to build software systems, we need to have some idea of what it is that we'd like them to do. But it's very easy to get confused between what it is that we'd like them to do and how they do it. For some kinds of systems, the user can also seem very far away from them. So what is a user story and what makes the difference between bad ones and good ones? Here are five mistakes that I see people make all of the time with user stories. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the video today, hit like as well. In this episode, we'll explore user stories and how to do a better job of them. I've got a great offer for you on one of the best books on this topic. So please do keep watching to see the details. It seems to me that software development is fundamentally about three things. Knowing the problem that we need to solve, writing the code that solves that problem, and checking that the problem we needed to solve is indeed solved. So the requirements of some kind, the development of some kind, and testing of some kind. For a long time, probably because we're technical people, we tended to skip over the first and sometimes the third in this list. But to do a good job, we need to get all three right. I spend a lot of time on this channel talking about testing, automated testing specifically, the third thing in my list. I do this because being good at testing and incorporating it into your approach to development is one of the best ways to do a good job of the second item in the list too, the design and coding of our systems. But what about the first step, understanding what our system is really for? What's the best way to understand and describe the problem itself? It turns out that doing a good job here also has a huge impact on the quality of the code that we write. Yet this is one of the commonest points of friction that I see software development teams suffering from. So here are my five common mistakes in user stories. And along the way, we'll look at what makes for good stories and talk about some of the techniques that can really help. First mistake, requirements as remote control programming. Fundamentally, this is a very common problem and it's grounded in a complete misunderstanding of what user stories really are. As ever, there's a translation problem if you're working in a traditional development organization, you have probably got things called requirements. Then someone comes along talking about all of this strange agile stuff. But in this case, it seems a fairly simple translation. Agile version of requirements are called user stories, right? Well, no, not really. User stories aren't really requirements in the traditional sense at all. User stories are not about programming by remote control. A story doesn't tell devs what code to write or what design to the solution should be. Instead, it's a description of the problem that we're trying to solve. That's a very different thing. Good stories say nothing at all about how a problem should be solved. Traditional requirements processes tend to be very focused on, a, on specifying a particular solution. This takes the form of requirements saying only how to change the system. Add a new list box with these entries. Add a new order button to the home page. If I wanted to be picky, and I usually do, these aren't requirements at all. They're programming by remote control. Nobody requires a new list box or a button to do a job. I'm pretty sure that I can imagine several different ways to give you what a list box or a button gives you. These instructions are certainly not user stories either. They are instead detailing the solution to the problem, not the problem itself. There are several difficulties with this. First, it completely clamps down on any kind of innovation. What if, when we understand the problem, whatever it is, we think of the world's best solution that nobody's ever thought of before? The first iPod introduced the rotary wheel on the front, which dramatically improved its usability when dealing with lots of songs. Much better than a list box and a collection of buttons at that point. If Steve Jobs had started out saying, we need a list box showing the list of songs, no one would have had the freedom to come up with something better. And if they had, it would have been wrong, because it wasn't a list box and that's what he'd asked for. 
no one would be thinking about the real need. My bet was that the discussion was much more likely along the lines of, we want people to be able to easily find and select the song that they want. That's a user story. The next problem is that if we specify the solution instead of the need, it tends to lead to development teams who are completely detached from the problems that they're working on. I think that this is pretty simple. If you don't really understand the problem you're working on, you won't be able to do a very good job, however good your coding skills. Our job as software developers is not to write code, it's to solve problems. To do that, we have to understand them. Next mistake, stories as a contract for change. This common mistake is to treat user stories as a contract for the work to be done. This is closely allied with the first problem, but is subtly different. This is particularly common in regulated industries where people need to document the changes. The mistake that people make is to write stories as detailed definitions of the change that they think that they want. Stories are not only meant to be a description of the problem we're trying to solve, but they should be a simple description. The detailed description is established as part of a conversation that comes later. It's not written down as a user story or as a requirement. Stories are meant to be placeholders for a conversation. If our stories take the forms of some kind of contract between, I don't know, the product owner and development team, you're doing it wrong. I think that there are a couple of reasons why this matters. First, we're trying to avoid some kind of contractual relationship between the people involved in devel development mediated by documentation. People are more creative when they collaborate, so we'd like them to collaborate often and decide for themselves when they need to. Contracts don't improve collaboration, they constrain it. The second problem is closely related to this. The written word is a low bandwidth form of communication. It's very easy to misinterpret what people write. Conversation makes it much easier to spot misunderstandings and then to have an interactive discussion to clarify things and correct them. The best teams talk together a lot. At the point where the development of a user story begins, what is supposed to happen is a conversation. This is the first point at which the detail is established and not before. This does mean that you have to find a different way to document what's in a release, but actually stories and acceptance tests that follow them are better at that than technical requirements. Next in my list, monster stories. Good user stories identify a useful unit of work, but the secret to doing high quality work efficiently is to work in fast, small steps. So the unit of work that the user story represents should be intentionally small. At the absolute maximum, we should be able to complete any user story within a single sprint or iteration, probably within a week or two, max. Ideally, stories are considerably shorter than this though, much nicer if you can complete them in a day or two. This starts to get us to one of the trickier problems with user stories. How do you break them down into small enough pieces so that we can complete each one quickly, but still deliver the value to the user? The whole point of a user story is that it represents something that is of value to a user, a valuable increment in the behavior of the system from the user's perspective. Where, where people get really hung up on this is what does of value to a user really mean? Dev teams often make another common mistake at this point, which is the fourth one in my list. The value to a user means valuable to a user. These are not the same thing at all. This is a very commonly missed subtlety in user stories. A stack of treasure is certainly valuable, but a penny has value too. It's just a smaller unit. In software development terms, this usually manifests itself in teams only perceiving user stories that do everything that the customer is ever likely to want as having value. This is wrong and a big problem in software development. I've seen teams working on what they call user stories sometimes for months at a time. That is really not what we're shooting for here at all. The idea is to work on things that move the software forwards. 
from a user's perspective. But the distance that each story moves us can and probably should be very small. Working in small steps is more efficient, easier to understand, makes it easier to backtrack if we make a mistake, and is less risky because each change is small, it's also better understood. It's perfectly reasonable that as we begin to work on understanding a problem, our ideas will probably be too coarse-grained, our story's too big at this point. But part of the skill is to refine this and to develop the ability to break stories down into smaller bite-sized pieces so that we have separate smaller stories. This is one of the reasons that I recommend Goiko and David's fantastic book. It gives lists of ways to focus on small increments. Avoid generic users, for example. Narrow the customer segment. Forget walking skeletons, put it on crutches, and simplify outputs are just some of the ex examples of the pieces of advice that they offer. Imagine we wanted to add the ability to log in to our great product. The mistake is to imagine all of the features associated with login that you can think your user ever wanting, and adding them all into a single massive login story. Instead, a much better approach is to imagine the smallest unit of value perceivable by your users that starts you moving in the direction of having all of the good stuff. Maybe we could start by registering users for a mail list or something. We could start by simply collecting email addresses, allowing us to develop the starting point for a simple registration form. This is certainly of some value to our users, not as much as a proper login, of course, but it allows us to get the skeleton of our system in place and doing something useful, which is, could be a reasonable amount of work. Next, we could perhaps add some features that registered users can see, but others can't. Clearly a real benefit now. Now we can get to think about the problems of authorization and solving those. We could add passwords next, perhaps later beefing up pass with password rules or for new registrations. I often hear development teams worry about the user value of these kinds of small, tiny features. Yes, they will, the users will value the whole feature more, but software development doesn't really work like that. It takes time. And so taking a more incremental approach gives us shorter time to value even if the value is smaller, and more opportunities to learn what really works for our users. Maybe not necessary for a logging system, which is well understood, but if you're developing something really new, a fantastic tool. At each step here, the user is getting a tiny bit more than they had before. I see nothing wrong in choosing how we interpret value to help us develop the software here. User stories are a development tool, not a religion, after all. They're here to help us establish an outside-in perspective on our system, so that it can keep us honest in trying to and maintain our focus on what really matters. I think that the primary value of user stories is to help us to achieve a very clear separation between what the system does and how it does it. Back to our login. Now we could imagine all kinds of small, simple stories that we could add. Stuff to cope with lost passwords, expiry of old, unused accounts, uh, features for more advanced user groups, uh, perhaps. All sorts of things. Working in small steps is important and valuable. Good user stories should help us with that. The last in my list is dependent stories. Um, this is a bad idea too. Uh, dependencies between stories cause all sorts of difficulties. It's kind of inevitable as we add new stories that they will build on code that we wrote for old ones. Um, and if we're doing a good job, that should probably mean that new stories will often be easier to write than the old ones. There's an ordering here because some of the work has already been done. The problem is in trying to manipulate that ordering in order to be able to optimize the development process. This then stops us focusing on the value that we're delivering 
And the danger is that they end, we end up focusing instead on massive, over-complex must-haves that actually add no real value at this point from the user's perspective. Good stories are atomic. That means we should be able to implement them in any order that we like. That doesn't mean that whatever the order we implement them in, the cost will be the same. The first story in a sequence of similar stories will sometimes involve more work. Perhaps we'll need to build some supporting infrastructure or create a new kind of test. These are simply the costs of doing that work. And well, they'll be roughly the same whatever story we start with, so don't worry about order. The route to value is shorter when we keep our eyes on the real goal, software that does something useful for people. This doesn't mean that we should cut corners on quality and do bad work. We do good work, but we do it as the stories demand it of us. We do good work even if it means taking a little bit more time over a particular story, but we also stay focused on delivering what it is that our users really want as quickly as we can. Stories help to keep us focused and over, tend to avoid over-engineering. Some of the ideas in this video were inspired by this book. My friend Goiko, one of the authors, has given um, viewers of this channel a 50% discount. This book is full of great ideas to improve your user stories. I carry a copy on my iPad to jog my memory when I'm stuck. So follow the link in the description below for 50% off 50 quick ideas to improve your user stories. User stories do kind of replace requirements, but they're a more subtle tool than that. They aren't just a different way to format a list of instructions to a development team. They're a tool to keep the development process as a whole focused on what really matters, providing our users with software that does something useful or fun. Thank you very much for watching.